Not everything needs to be solved. Not everything needs a why. Sometimes mm. just letting things be. And also not reflecting on how I could have done things better. Because mm. you'll just sit there and spin and cycle. You're listening to Being Built. I'm Aaron Davis, founder of Reliant Search Group, here with Alicia Donovan Brainerd. Welcome to the show. Thanks. You're the director of data foundations for Foursquare and a general great person. A lot of my friends know you and like you, so I figured we should become friends too. Perfect. <laughs> Happy to hear it. Appreciate you being here. <laughs> yeah, thanks. So we were talking. I knew we had to turn the cameras on because you started saying something smart. Uh, you were talking about leaders um, who have kind of the hero complex or the tendency to throw the cape on and save the day. Yes. What's your attitude toward that? So while I think the leader feels like it's a noble thing to do in the mm. moment, it's not amplifying the team and the company and the people mm. that are involved. Because I think at the end of the day, not only is the leader not doing their job and having deeper conversations with the team, talking about strategy, doing all of these things, but they're not giving their employees a chance to actually do the work that they should be digging into and they're yeah. excited about. They take that away from them. So my, my general philosophy is I would rather my team get kudos all day long and me not hear a word um, yeah. about my performance. And I feel like my managers kind of should be in that same, that same court. Mm. Yeah, it's a good attitude. That's a very humble same. acceptance of uh, your responsibilities as a leader, right? Yeah. Uh, not everybody is as gracious when it comes to sharing attention. I remember once I had a, I had a boss once and I was kind of I was sharing with her several things I had, not just I, but my team, my team and I had accomplished. And I remember her saying, well, you didn't do that. So-and-so did that. And so-and-so did that. And so-and-so did that. And I was like, well, yeah, I know. That was her and that was him and that was her. And, but it was like, she didn't want me to cite the accomplishments of my team in my mind like en enabling and supporting them was the work i was doing as a leader right a hundred percent but in her mind she wanted to count my individual productivity like and compare it to my team and i'm like god it feels like such a miss if i was heads down like half of those things wouldn't have happened right yeah. if i was engaged providing resources clarifying direction it multiplies right those are all things that multiply because you're putting tools in the hands of the somebody that's stronger, right? Well, and I think there's a big conversation about like being a multiplier versus a detractor and like you mm. touched on it. I mean, it's, you want to keep multiplying and by doing the work and not raising these people up and you're being a detractor, mm. you're not helping the business, you're not helping them, you're not helping your boss, customers, mm -hmm. so you're not focused on the right things. I've got my own little kind of leadership guideposts or whatever that I that I go to, but I heard somebody the other day um, a new friend, I was, uh, met him for a drink and he said one of his two, like most important leadership principles. And I can't remember the second, but one of them that he said was as a leader, I feel like my, my two most important things to do is to grow and develop other leaders and then whatever the other one was. But yeah. the fact that he considered that to be one of his most important objectives and responsibilities as a leader, I've done that before and it, and it makes you invisible. I mean, it makes you, that's why I was kind of inspired by what you said. Yeah. And like you're happy, content for somebody else to be acknowledged and be recognized. And I think um, when you've still got an appetite to be acknowledged and be recognized, it, you're gonna, it's going to get in your way as a leader. Because like you said, you're going to be a detractor because you're chasing those kudos that you've become accustomed to, to wanting. You know what I mean? It's an addictive little dopamine mental hit, right? When somebody's like, great job, Stan, or whatever. Um, so yeah, kind of weaning yourself off that I think is part of becoming a multiplier, right? And there's a cost to it too. I mean, at what mm. cost? So, you know, whether it's balance, work-life balance, you know, are you going to keep mm. running after those things too? Can we go all the way back to your origin story? Sure. <laughs> so, um, I don't know how far you back. You My origin story. Yeah, your <laughs> origin story. We're going to be here for a minute. <laughs> this is 60 minutes. There's a toxic spell. <laughs> <laughs> a spider bite or whatever. <laughs> The question that came to mind is like, how, because I, I don't know really your roots or whatever, but yeah, how did you get your start in, um, in leadership, I guess? But I'm, I'm also curious how you got your start in technology in general. Yeah. So I, I got my start in technology kind of a different way. Um, I was going to Miami University and I was actually majoring in journalism. 
okay. which was really exciting for me. And I went to go to my internship over the summer. Didn't pay a lot of attention at the time. And I started talking to the news station that I was at and was like, great. So I think I missed the, the salary range for the internship. And they're like, oh, it's unpaid. And I was like, <laughs> okay, we need, we need to have a deeper sucks. conversation. Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And I need to, you know, hurry up and switch majors and, you know, figure out something different. Yeah. So during that point, um, I was already taking technology courses on the side um, and kind of realized like, hey, there's an internship with a company called Avery Dennison. And I started okay. getting into, oh, yeah, into tech. Them. Yeah. Miamisburg, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, this branch was in Cincinnati and okay. started getting into tech, um, did an internship with them, did Lotus Notes, which okay. we're not going to pretend <laughs> we know what that is anymore. <laughs> um, but Yeah. Did Lotus Notes. And then from there, it was just kind of exciting because the office that I was in, like not only was there technology in there, but there was human resources and finance all in one office with me. So mm -hmm. being excited and that person at the time, I was like, finish my engineering work. Like, let me go help these help these other groups. Mm -hmm. And then I started to think, what would it look like to do all of those things in one job? Like, what kind of job is that? I want that. Mm -hmm. And that's where my career kind of started evolving over the years. Yeah. And, you know, had opportunities at various companies from LexisNexis to Salesforce to now Foursquare. So you got your start early then. I did. An internship. <laughs> you were still a student? Yeah, I was still a student. Um, like how far into school were you? Um, you changed your major. So yeah, you were changed in the middle my of major. it somewhere. So about like two and a half years. -ish. Yeah. Yeah. Why don't, why don't more women major in technology, computer science? And I know what my why was. Um, yeah. My dad was in technology and okay. engineering. Okay. And I was thinking like. I want to do something different. Mm -hmm. Like I don't, I don't need to do the exact same thing. But then that's I, what young adults do, yeah. right? I want to be the exact opposite. <laughs> like of it how I, can I yeah. completely divert? Um, and my dad's now a data architect, and I lead data teams. So like here we are. Interesting. Um, <laughs> it just happens. He had a few things right. Huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think it's just, I don't know if there's a stigma there, um, mm -hmm. or if it's just not something that's introduced in the earlier years. And I think that's really a lot of it. Like there's not that period in high school where they talk about, you know, how exciting technology is mm -hmm. for women and all of the opportunities out there. Because there are a lot of opportunities, there are a lot of groups um, and mentoring programs for women specifically in tech. Oh, yeah. I've never been invited to a men who code. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's no men who code. <laughs> Girls who code but is... There's plenty yeah. of men who code, but there's mm -hmm. no groups, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's cool. They, you know, when I was... Uh, and as a student, I remember, you know, tech stuff was still kind of new or whatever. But, um, you know, we had little breakout sessions and whatever else. And it was so new that I don't remember. I, it wasn't, there wasn't enough going on for me to have ever noticed a difference in the interest levels between boys and girls or whatever else. But I work in the recruiting field and it's just, we're very attentive to and care very much about trying to find the women that work in technology. And sometimes it's difficult. It's definitely difficult. And I noticed that, um, you know, leading engineering teams and even hiring myself mm -hmm. for engineers, um, my internal recruiting partners, you know, at my last company, they would share with me resume after resume after resume. Mm -hmm. And I noticed I've got 200 resumes and there's not one female in this list. Yeah. Well, the, the, the odds aren't that bad. Right? Uh, or the are. ratios aren't that bad. They are. Um, and even now, like, there's just not, and I think there is a stigma with women if, you don't check all of the boxes in the job description, you don't apply. Yeah, I've read that. Um, th there is, there's good data on that, that yeah. women are less likely to apply. When, I think there's something we can, there are things we can do about that. I, I apply this technique in all of my recruiting in general, but I, and I don't have enough data to know whether or not it's really worked in terms of uh, hiring women versus men. But I always try to state things in terms of preferences, mm -hmm. right? Um, because in reality, nothing is almost, almost nothing is really required. You're looking for the right cocktail that mixes right. But like you could, you know, you can make a margarita with vodka. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> so, like, <laughs> I, so you can, you know, you can almost change anything, right? Um, if enough of the ingredients are right, it's still a margarita, so to speak, right? So if you get the analogy, that's yeah. goofy, but you get what I'm saying. So I, I always try to state things in terms of preferences because, and then highlight, focus on, this is what we're trying to accomplish. If this sounds like the kind of thing you would enjoy accomplishing, then, and you bring enough of the tools, you know, to the job or whatever, we can get it done together, right? But I don't know how effective that is, but I have read that, I've seen that same data that 
when they're much more inclined to pass on a job if they don't meet 100 percent well and i like the way that you put that like these are you know here's some preferences like not all of these are musts like and i think that's the part that just yeah there needs to be like an entire course or book or thing or yeah some like revolution on that <laughs> there's a ton of them <laughs> there are, but like just just a one kind of focus area with just the quick like here's the tldr like yeah let, that's let's right. roll i you know i find that recruiting toward things you want to accomplish is a missed opportunity um man i'm trying to remember the name of this dude he's kind of like a recruiting guru I can see his face. Um, I can't remember his name right now. But anyway, he was, he kind of, uh, in my mind anyway, he probably wasn't the first guy I thought of this, but he's the one that taught me mm -hmm. that um, writing job descriptions less about skills that need to be done or, or tasks that you'll be responsible for and less about requirements of skills that you have to have and more about this is the, you know, because as soon as somebody shows up, yeah. you're like, okay, here's your goals, three, six, nine months or whatever. Why don't we? Why yeah, you're not going down that the list the of skills. Like, tell me about, like, let's do something with Scott. Right now. <laughs> let's do something with Java right now. Like, no. no, you start talking about, okay, these are the things to be accomplished. And this is kind of the general guide to when and why it's going to be accomplished. Like, those are the things to talk about. Yeah. In the very beginning of a relationship when you're hiring someone. Anyway, I didn't mean for this to be an interview about hiring. That's fine. <laughs> but uh, yeah, your origin story kind of intrigued me because you made a mid mid-college career change um yeah. that's un that's uncommon enough but it's cool that you switched from journalism into technology and that, and that was a little bit money motivated huh yeah it was definitely um it was a how can i survive you know the summer and summers mm. um kind of coming up mm. and what does that look like because i i don't want to ask my family for support yeah i want to do it on my own yeah well in a little bit you had a point of reference motivated too so you kind of knew what yeah technology work looked like having having family uh that did it did you have any other you know like key influencers mentors along the way have you had have you had big influence people have, we all have somebody or a little yeah. bit but have you had anybody in your experience that was kind of like pivotal in terms of your career changes or I mean, I would say at every single company I've worked at um, throughout the years, and there's way too many to list here, um, yeah. but every single company I've gravitated and found a mentor in, mm. in a company. Um, mm. I can think back when I worked at Nation Builder, the CEO of the company, Leah Andres, like yeah. she she was 100% my mentor. Really? She was a badass woman like mm -hmm. that just got and into she took a an room. interest in you? Yeah. And she took an interest in me and was able to coach me and like say the hard things to me mentor mm. me and you know it wasn't it wasn't a soft relationship by any means and conversation with her at, at any given time it was very challenging yeah i guess you know very challenging so she wouldn't mm. just go into a room and status quo like wasn't the mm -hmm. thing she was always pushing and always trying to get you outside of your growth edge or comfort zone or space i used to think friends were people who you would do fun things with you Mm -hmm. Um, and then I realized literally any stranger anywhere will do that. They could care about you. Not one bit. Like you could literally just meet a random person at a coffee shop or a bar. And if you're doing something fun or you have a fun story or whatever, any random person will do fun stuff with you. Yeah. And then I learned, I think maybe in the course of being an entrepreneur or something, that real friends are the ones who are like, Hey, get your fat ass up. It's time to go to the gym or, Hey, like, <laughs> why aren't you, why aren't you calling on this person? That, that would be, you know, Oh, you're afraid they're going to say, no, you're a wimp. Come on, do it. Like I, I learned that friends are the people who will push you, yeah. you know, and challenge you and say hard things and say, ah, your website looks gar garbage. You know what I mean? Um, why, why are you saying this? It makes you look stupid. <laughs> right. Um, you got to write, you got to earn a right to do that. You got to earn a little bit of trust or whatever, but I learned that friends are the ones who do the hard stuff, right? So yeah. good that you found a friend and a mentor, somebody that would challenge you, you know? I, I've always tried to pick, I don't want to say the loudest person in the room or the, you know, as a mentor or it's it's really that person that's doesn't say yes to everything. And mm -hmm. that's the person like I kind of target and go after as my mentor. Like, let's find that person that pushes me completely out of my comfort zone because mm -hmm. that's where I need to be. Do you have any friends now or valued colleagues, work friends, whatever, that were at some point you had a, a conflict with them or you didn't like them? 
I don't know about conflict. So one of one of my best friends, um, she was my my yoga teacher. Um mm. and she pushed me to my limits every <laughs> single, every single class, every single practice, every single teacher training. Mm. It was always a, you know, a little bit more here, like move your legs down or this or that or any, any, anything. Um, mm. She pushed me over the years and I always respected that and yeah. was always like, oh, like, is it just me? Like, am I, am I the only person she's doing this to? Like, yeah. cause it felt like it. So you felt attacked at yeah. one point, and then, then you realized you were being built. And I was like, this is great. So like, at the end of the day, I was like, I'm getting all of this attention because she wants to push me harder and make mm. me better. Like, that's what this looks like. Um, and years later, like, we're great friends. We're doing dinner this evening. Like, nice. it's just, right. it's one of those things where it's just like, and she, you know, we talk about the why. And she's mm. like, here's why. Like, I was telling you, like, to hold plank for four minutes. Like, <laughs> it's endurance. It's strength. It's, you know, mindset. Just making a killer out of you. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> so um that was year, a couple of years ago. So I don't know, about yeah. four minutes, maybe about like three and a half now. It's good. I'm glad you guys kind of found the found that connection. I got a couple friends like that that were I just thought they they irritated me at some point. You know, they would they would grind on me or whatever. And eventually I realized it's it's because they were it was respect. You yeah. know what I mean? Like you find an old Chevy Chevette, you know, at the dump, you're not going to be like, oh, I want to restore this. It's the thing you find the old jewel. You're like, okay, I'm going to go bang on that thing and fix it up or whatever, right? I'm not really a car guy, so I'm not sure why I chose that analogy, but you get what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> well, different topic. What yeah. you, let's talk about what you're building. I'm curious yeah. what you're working on at Foursquare. So at Foursquare, um, I lead the data teams over there. So. Okay. We're building a lot of incredible things. Um, I mean, a lot of what you do there is data, right? Yeah. I mean, it's a, it, it's all about providing data to, if I understand it correctly, it's all about geospatial data, right? Like, yeah, providing data um, to customers and ensuring that we have the right data and mm -hmm. data quality is really important. So mm -hmm. when you go to dinner with your family, you check the Foursquare app and you want to see like, is this place still open? Mm -hmm. You don't want to drive all the way there and it'd be closed. Mm -hmm. That's right. So the importance of this data, you know, not only from just a, that perspective, but it also helps companies or GPS when you're going mm -hmm. somewhere, when you've got to be there quickly, you want to make sure these locations are still there. Mm -hmm. The maps are accurate, all of these things. Mm -hmm. um, so these are just some of the things that my team provides mm -hmm. for our customers. And mm -hmm. What's the biggest challenge you're facing right now that you're working through? There's so many places where data comes in. We've got first party data, we've got third party data, and ensuring all that data is accurate. Because mm -hmm. you could check in down the street at a restaurant and maybe it's a building away and you're not there yet and you just want to uh, check in really quick. Okay. So our app's going to be. Your hands like, off your seatbelt yeah. and it's just convenient time for you to do it, but you're yeah. you're not on. Okay. And you're like, cool, like I'm gonna I'm gonna check in at this restaurant, but then I check in at the actual restaurant, and then the app's like is it where Aaron said or Alicia? Like, where, mm. where are we at? So, so that would be first person data, right? Yeah. Or, so that's, you know, like first party, like data, mm -hmm. like coming in through, through the app. Um, through the user, yeah. Yeah. Which is, it's kind of exciting to see. So it's kind of figuring out like, is it Aaron's? Is it Alicia's? Like, mm. let's keep going and see other users and check-ins and things like that to see, mm. see what's accurate. Is our data quality right? Yeah. Is it street or is it ST? Or does that mean the same thing? <laughs> So now you got me curious, like, where do people check in? Is it parking lots or is it at the front door? Yeah. And you can check in. I mean, I can check into Spain from here. Like, yeah. so it's just, you know, mm -hmm. it's interesting. I'm picturing like a scatter plot or whatever of check-in points or whatever. And somewhere in the middle of that or whatever is the actual front door or whatever. Right. So we're starting to do shapes too. So oh, yeah. being okay. able to tell like, what shape is this building? And does mm -hmm. that, does that track? Mm. Um, why were there a thousand check-ins at Aaron's coffee shop this morning and not the Walmart garden center? Like, is it mm -hmm. really the Walmart garden center? Is Aaron got some good coffee over there. <laughs> <laughs> right. So who's your biggest competitor? I don't know if you would say like a Apple or a Google because we do partner with them and we provide data mm -hmm. for them and they provide data for us. Mm -hmm. Um, good question. Thanks. And if we go into the ad space too, there's, you know, we've got stuff in the ad space too. Um, yeah for our team. So I've got mm -hmm. movements and transactions teams that track Aaron mm -hmm. got an ad from Bed Bath & Beyond today. Like, did mm -hmm. he go in there and buy something with this coupon we sent him? Mm -hmm. Cool. He went in the store, but did he swipe his credit card? 
Yeah. So those are all groups within within my organization. Well, which plus, is you guys have a whole social aspect to the app, so it's like yeah, it's a whole different kind of competition or whatever in terms of your user. Yeah, you like can be, what be a mayor. Kind of attention are you competing with, right? Like, what other thing might somebody be paying attention to? Yeah. It's hard to know who your competitor is these days. You know, like, yeah, because all of us do, you know, I guess it's always been true, but it's not exactly like I make corn. I do, you know, I'm a lawyer, I'm a mechanic, like the niches that everybody gets into and the products that people build and the, the, the services firms are maybe a little bit more straight up, but it's, it's weird when you're building product. Well, and it depends who you talk to, right? So if it's, you know, the Foursquare app, like, is it Yelp? Mm -hmm. Like, is that the competitor? Right. Like, I don't, you know, maybe. Yeah, you got like 12 different types of competitors, let alone like who are the big ones, right? Yeah. Do you map like or, di or, or define who the like hero is or like who's your persona? Do you have like a, a target persona or do you guys, do you get into that space at all in your organization? What do you mean by that the target persona? Yeah, like, like who's your like... What's the profile of the typical user, right? Like, is there a kind of an identity for that person? Is it a young person? Is it an old person? Whatever, right? Like, um, I think we've got multiple personas. Like, really, yeah. like you want all of the information, all of the data, all of the check-ins, especially like once you start going to the the ad space. Mm. So, you know, mm. I want to know that like you're buying clothes at Sears. Because, mm -hmm. you know, you're a certain demographic and you're buying clothes at Sears versus <laughs> buying clothes, you know, from J. Crew or right, wherever right. else. Like, I don't think Sears exists anymore. I don't right? think so either. that's yeah. a perfect description. <laughs> Feels right. <laughs> because at one point they did and yeah. uh, you would be older. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I, I don't think there's one customer um, yeah. for our web applications that we've got and mobile yeah. apps. What are you trying to build next? Like, what's your kind of frontier or whatever? What's your. Um, objective over the next year or so? So the biggest objective for us is data quality um, mm -hmm. and ensuring that data quality is clean across different geographies. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing could be different in the US versus France. Um, you know, streets may not be called streets or, mm -hmm. you know, just ensuring that all of these words and all of these things are standardized across, across countries. Mm -hmm. And the better our data is, the more customers purchase our data and mm -hmm. be able to use their data. So how do you clean up your data if it's all user provided? So, I mean, there there's other types of data. Like we've purchased companies over the years, so we have mm. other data. It's not all first party. There's okay. third party data as well. Um, and I, cleaning it up, like we've got machine learning um, teams as well within our organization. So there's some machine learning that kind of goes into it and some AI that goes into it. Mm. There's also some manual um, engineering work where my teams will kind of go in as well and just start to look up like street is the same as street mm -hmm. and ST and it could be like ST period and just cleaning up some things like that where you're like, feels like common sense, but you know, computers don't always know that. Like it's, yeah. it's not always clean and it doesn't always format the same way. Everybody's like, oh, AI is going to take over everything. If they only knew <laughs> how much there was to do still. There's right. there's so much work. <laughs> there's so much gritty, manual, nuanced stuff. It still needs a lot of attention. Yeah. We got, we got, so we took a little detour down that path. That was fun. I, I want to go back to your origin story. Okay. So after you were bit by the spider. Yep. Uh, <laughs> um. Maybe we're going to the Spidey suit now. Um, what I'm curious about your origin story as a leader, because mm -hmm. um, at some point you went from writing code or building tech to building teams. Right? right. Tell me how that transpired. So when I was working at LexisNexis, um, I started off as a contractor there okay. and was leading um, data, a data fabrication team and kind of doing some business development work and things like that. Mm. And... There was an opportunity in that group after a little while to basically transition a data center to AWS, mm. which was something that was really new at the time. Yeah. And it was interesting and intriguing. And they asked me if I wanted to be a part of that, being that I was a part of some of the earlier initiatives and things like that. Mm -hmm. I was like, sure, absolutely. And then they started having engineers report to me from mm. multiple different teams. So Okay. 
we had a storage team, we had a, you know, a database team, a Windows team, a Unix team, Linux, all of the things. Mm -hmm. And so I started, it wasn't just, you know, one or two engineers. It was like 20 plus at the end of the wow. day engineers. So I was kind of learning by fire um, yeah. at, at the moment. Yeah. Um, so it was, it was definitely a, a plunge um, into, into leading people. And the, the thing that I thought about every single time I had a conversation with an employee was this is their time. Like mm. you need to basically help them with whatever they need in this moment. This mm. 30 minutes, this hour, this 45 minutes, this water cooler conversation is for mm. them. Like let's really try and pull in like what they're looking for from you mm. and offer that up. And if so, they start to detract and start to talk about status, like dial it back to them and their career and how you can help them. Mm. So that early on, you were already that. I was already in mature. that headspace. Um, how, how did you get that? Like, wh where did that come from? A lot of people go, you know, they're leading for 10, 20 years and before they finally sit in some class or read some book or something that teaches them that yeah. kind of thing. So where where'd you get that? Like, it wasn't a class or a book. It was always something I think I found, I found my dad doing it even with me um, mm. and family members just listening so intently and then asking questions mm. and then pausing. And there could be awkward silence for five, 10 minutes and then a thought. Mm. Or would you like me to respond to this or are you just looking for me to listen? Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh. That's some like great marriage advice too, yes. right? Like, <laughs> so much of leadership I find is just so useful too when it comes to being a spouse and being a parent or a good friend, whatever. Like it's like, it's just generally, like leadership, general, generally speaking, like most of leadership is also really useful Mm -hmm. in just relationships in general, right? Like being a better listener, being enabling, being supportive, clarifying. Yeah. Um, but when you said, do you need me just to listen or do you need a solution? That just sounds like something I've been paying attention to in my marriage, right? <laughs> so, yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, that's cool too. That, I mean, that's smart leadership uh, advice yeah. too. And I think just hearing it my entire life was just one of those things where I just kind of dialed into it where it was like, I don't know the tech that they're working on. Like, I'm not a database mm. engineer. I'm not a storage engineer. I don't do Linux, but mm -hmm. here's where, you know, I can try and help them. And what does that look like? What do they need from me? Do they, do they just feel like venting in this like time or mm. like, are they looking for me to solve things? Mm -hmm. And if so, like, here's how far I can go. <laughs> mm -hmm. My son came to me not long ago, a couple weeks ago or something, maybe a couple months. I don't remember, but um, he's a new homeowner and, he needed to build a fence and he knew I was pretty handy with tools and such. And so he started telling me his plan and I was like, well, have you, and he's like, well, hold on. I just want to tell you my plan. Tell me if it makes sense. In other words, <laughs> I, what I really loved about that, and I was like impressed with him yeah, because he was self-aware enough to know that he wasn't asking for advice. He just wanted to say his plan out loud. And to somebody who would tell him whether or not that makes sense at the end of it. And it was, he was really just looking for validation. And so he was, a, he knew at that point, he didn't want somebody to tell him how to do it. He's like, no, I just, I need to say this out loud to somebody who understands what I'm saying. Right. Um, and just being in the presence of somebody who kind of gets close enough to what he was saying would, would create clarity for him. Right. And he knew that's what he needed. And so I, I shut up. He didn't tell me to shut up. He was very <laughs> polite and grateful. But um, so I was, but he was self aware enough to kind of give me the cue. And so I just shut up and I listened. And I was like, yeah, I think you're, you're thinking it through well. That makes sense. And that's it. That's all he needed. You know, and he was missing a couple pieces or whatever that he'll go figure out. He wasn't missing the ability to figure it out. Right. Um, but yeah, I was kind of like, I was proud of him in that moment. And it was also like a great way to exercise that skill as a, as a leader, you know, being kind of a leader in that moment. But, um, yeah, and it's interesting. Wise. It's, it's not something you learn in school. You just, you got it from your family, from your dad, yeah. you said. Yeah, yeah. It's, and it's, it's something that should be taught in school, um, at all yeah. ages. Like what type of validation are you looking for? Are you looking for validation? I've heard people say everything else, like, oh, you should learn how to do your taxes and balance a checkbook when we were, you know, when people used to balance checkbooks, or <laughs> when there weren't apps doing it for you. But anyway, um, 
all these practical life skills or oh, we should learn how to code when you're children and all, everybody, everybody's got the ideals of what should be taught in school. But I've never heard anybody say, oh, you should learn like basic communication, listening and leadership skills yeah. in school. And you really don't. You really don't learn those things because you're supposed to learn them from your family. And it's your entire life to. moving forward, know. like essentially in all of the areas. But so many people don't learn those things in their family dynamic. I mean, mm -hmm. I would say maybe most people don't. What do you think? I don't know. It's a unique enough and value en valuable enough skill set that I'm inclined to think that most people don't learn it. I, I yeah. completely agree with you. Um, and just in conversations that I've been in with other leaders mm -hmm. and, you know, bosses um, from the past, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily have that same Right, they weren't raised the way you were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of like, okay, here's what to do. And I was like, wait, 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 we're, no. Yeah. I'm just, again, like, like your son, like, yeah. I'm just validating, like, this, this is the way I'm doing it. Like, do you see anything glaring? If you do, share it. If not, like, let's, let's roll. Do you still have a good relationship with your dad? I do. Yeah. You guys, you get to spend a lot of time together or? Uh, decent amount. So my family lives in Rhode Island. So I go okay. and visit them. That's um, kind of what I was asking. Yeah. Like, are they close enough to be able to spend time with them? But yeah. Yeah. That's good. Um, I was going to say, you should say thank you if you hadn't, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's good. I think to reflect on the things we're grateful for the gifts we were given by people, because tell me what your attitude is on this. Um, what's the secret to your success? Oh, you work hard and this is how I became successful and whatever. And then some people would be like, well, I got this lucky break and I was fortunate here. And this person, you know, backed me financially or, you know, my mom encouraged me to go to call it, whatever, you know, like people will cite the things, the lucky breaks that they had or how they were lucky or fortunate. Yep. And then other people, when you ask them what the secret to success was, they will cite their hard work and how they overcame and whatever. And maybe both are true, Yeah. but even when it's your own work ethic, intelligence, good decision-making discipline, you learn that even that, even those things were a gift that you got somewhere, whether it was reading a book or, or a mentor or some, or a friend that challenged you, like all, even those things that you did, that you brought, that you learned how to do. Like, I think I learned discipline when I was in the army and whatever. And I learned that, oh, I can, I can keep running, even though my body is telling me to quit and that I want to die. <laughs> <laughs> right? Like I learned that with somebody in a green suit yelling at me. <laughs> so, I don't know if that's the best way to learn that, but that's how I learned it. You know, you yeah. can learn it playing sports. You can learn it from your parents, whatever. And I learned. So anyway, even the things that you are responsible for at some, somewhere down there, if you keep asking, well, well, how did you know to do that? How'd you know to do that? Anyway, that's my attitude toward it. What's your secret success? I'm lucky. I got really lucky. I'm very fortunate. There are people who work harder than me that are dirt poor. There are people who are smarter than me that are not successful professionals right yeah and it's anyway. interesting too um i think about even just my own career and i think about how many times i've been laid off mm. from companies and you know i, I can definitely count them um mm -hmm. and it's every single time i end up in a better role in a better position <laughs> with more leadership more pay more responsibility and just yeah keep growing and it's but it's those moments in between of uncertainty where I just need to pause and take a beat and be like, okay, I need to reset. Mm -hmm. Like, what is, what is this reset? Like, is it teaching yoga on a beach in the Dominican for a week? And that was my reset <laughs> the last time. Um, really? Which was exciting and fun and, you know, outside of the norm. How do you deal with stress? Like in the regular throes of life and work when you're not in some kind of transitional period? Yeah. Um, so I've got a pretty strong yoga meditation practice. Mm. Um, I'm a yoga instructor on the All side, right, which, okay. yeah. um, which <laughs> so is So you've fun. got some great habits around exactly that problem. Huh? Yeah. I mean, I've got some, some pretty good habits. And then I think the other part is just, you know, realizing that not everything needs to be solved. Not everything needs a why. Sometimes mm. just letting things be. Um, and also not reflecting on how I could have done things better. Because you'll just sit there and spin and cycle. And over the last, I would say, year or so, like I've stopped, I've stopped thinking about the past and really just tried to figure out like, how can I keep moving forward and evolving in my life, in my career, in my relationships? Like, what what does that look like? It's so where you at now? Still evolving. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's. But I'm once I start to see myself kind of circling back or like funneling on something and trying to figure out, you know, why did you why did you just do this? Mm -hmm. I'll pause and like, 
it doesn't matter. Like here we are, like, what are we doing now? What are you working on or what are you trying to improve on yourself or how are you challenging yourself now? Like what's new for you or what's next for you? I think the next thing is, I mean, continuing to, to mentor at a, at a lar- larger scale mm-hmm. is the next thing for me. I've started to do more speaking engagements, have mm-hmm. more conversations and just really have a bigger, bigger outreach than just my team, my company. Now it's my community and like, what is it mm-hmm. after that? And just a, one little car on your train of, of speaking engagements, right? This is incredible. I enjoy this. <laughs> you were fortunate to have a, at least one good mentor or model early on and then have had several since. Mm-hmm. You've collected a, you know, a book of knowledge of sorts to carry and deploy from your, your own experiences. If you were to think about, you know, if you were, Maybe it's not exactly you or some version of you, somebody else who reminds you of yourself or whatever that's thinking about leadership or contemplating kind of career steps. What advice would you give to somebody that's, uh, what advice would you give to somebody who's new in their career about how to prepare and how to uh, take advantage of opportunity or lead well? Like, what would you, what would your kind of first thing, your first thought be? Uh, My first thought would be to, Talk to everyone. Hmm. Have conversations with every single person in the room. Hmm. Get to know, get to know them, get to know what they're working on, why they're doing something. So if you start in a company, like start to talk to, you know, the customer support teams, figure out what their pain points are. Hmm. Talk to finance, talk to, you know, talk to different groups outside of your organization to better understand. Hmm. And to be able to, at the end of the day, come up with creative solutions that can be outside the box. Because now you're starting to understand. You're starting to understand your customers, your company. You're starting to build your own brand. Mm. People are going to come back to you and being that trusted advisor. Hey, I remember that time I had that conversation with, with this person. They listened to me. Mm-hmm. And being curious. And I think it's, it's really, it comes down to curiosity. Mm-hmm. Is that like a core principle for you? It is. I'm I'm always curious about things to to an extent. I'm I'm curious about engineering and coding, but am I going to go out there and learn the latest language? Probably not. Yeah, same. I mean, the finer details <laughs> of execution and application, whatever they, they they can be, you can put blinders on and, and not see anything else if you if you dive too deep into any one thing. Yeah. Curiosity is. I mean, that's a kind of fundamental value for my firm too actually reliability sincerity curiosity kind of what we base our whole practice on and it's the curiosity that i deploy or that i adhere to or that kind of feels natural or right to me is trying to see from a bigger picture trying to kind of step out Mm -hmm. a little bit i tend to engage into problem solving and a lot of times the problem is just not having a broad enough view so I found that same kind of experience that um, getting a different party's perspective or, or stepping back or stepping up. I think a lot of relationships and leadership in hierarchies or whatever happened because I often find my, there was a, there was a point in time in my career where I realized that guy might be a little bit of a jerk, but he might actually be right. He might be dealing with a problem you don't understand. Mm-hmm. Right. And so I, I would hear people grumble. And I would start to realize people are grumbling because they don't understand something. And the real problem there is that that leader who's creating contempt or whatever with the team isn't making it clear what kind of problem they're working on, right? They're not, they're not making it evident to everybody else what they're really dealing with. So you, we have this tendency as the, the doers or the lower level leaders or whatever think, oh, they're dumb. They don't know what they're doing. They're making dumb decisions. They're not making dumb decisions. They're just communicating poorly. They aren't right. saying what they're really dealing with. They aren't articulating or clarifying what the real problem is that they're grappling with, right? Just, and, and sometimes it's because they're embarrassed about them. Yeah. Um, maybe it's because they don't. They think they've said it and they haven't. Who knows why? But anyway, yeah, I think curiosity about what the higher. That's where I was going with that. That helped me get ahead a little bit. So that's that's great advice. I wish I'd have done that earlier. Yeah, I think curiosity is definitely key. And just, again, like networking, Mm. like anywhere you can network and have a conversation and, you know, whether it's out volunteering in the community and just talking to people or networking with friends and getting introductions. And Mm -hmm. the more conversations you have, 
with people, I think the more opportunities there are. Um, I know specifically, I was, I would think I was at a breaking point with my resume and I talked to you. <laughs> oh, with me? Yeah. yeah. And you told me, you're like, I bet you 500 bucks. Like this resume is fine. <laughs> you don't have to change. I've never been quoted thing. on this show before. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but essentially you said that and it gave me like, again, like it kind of gave me, there was a point of validation there mm. where I was like this thing that you've been spending 60 hours and waking up at 2 a.m. thinking about, mm -hmm. it's actually okay. Like, mm -hmm. It was. It's just not your time yet. Like now that you remind me, thing. I remember. I remember seeing your resume. It was fine. Yeah. You know what? That's that's so often the case that somebody's like, "Oh, I've got." It. I think, hey, look at my resume. Okay, can we talk resumes for a yeah, second? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think when you're looking for a job, it's a great idea. It's a horrible idea to worry about your resume, and it's a great idea to ask people for advice on your resume. And here's why I say those two things. And when you ask somebody for advice on your resume. It gets them to read your resume. And so it helps you tell the story of who you are. Um, inevitably, they're going to give you some pointer. It sure. doesn't matter if you just paid $8,000 to the best, right? You know, you could have had Malcolm Gladwell could have written your resume or whatever, <laughs> some renowned writer or whatever could have written your resume. And you, and it's, it's somebody's still going to give you a pointer on how to improve it. You can iterate, improve, change your bullet font, blah, 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 forever. Um, it's not going to change anything. It's not going to change that much. It, but it's great to ask people for input because, one, they'll read your resume. And, two, people like to help out in easy ways, right? It's a it's a super quick, you know, dopamine, dopamine hit, hit or yeah. whatever, right? <laughs> like, oh, your bullets are too big. Use the smaller bullets or whatever. Or, oh, your, your intro is too long-winded. Use too many big words. Just kind of simplify it. Write it at a sixth grade level, right? Or whatever, whatever their bias is, right? Somebody give you the quickie advice. Ah, oh, thank you. And then they get that satisfaction of being able to throw the cape on, which we're all addicted to, yeah. and be a little bit of a hero. So advice about resumes is ask when you're job searching, ask people to look at your resume. Second piece of advice, don't worry about your resume. In reality, it's fine. It's probably fine. Like, did you use the template? Did you uh, did you say these are things I actually accomplished versus tasks I was responsible for? Did you, you know, tell a quick narrative about what the value you bring? Don't say what your objective is. Say what's in it, you know, what's in it for me, your employer. Yep. Like tell them what you're bringing to the table. Just summarize some of your basic accomplishments or key skills or whatever. But it, most people do that. They, most people do that pretty fine. Maybe one out of 20 times, somebody will show me a resume and it's kind of garbage and it needs to be worked. But the other 99 and a half percentage of the time, it's, that math doesn't add up, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> the vast majority of the time, everybody's resume is great, and you need to be networking. Yeah. I think people miss the opportunity to network with people who don't understand your work, too. Network out of your skill set or function. I call it the gardener and the grandma. Talk to me about that. Okay, so it's, you're interviewing me now. You're going to be good at this yeah. whole speaking engagement thing. <laughs> so my gardener and grandma uh, advice is that you need to be able, the gardener and the grandma are people that know you and like you, mm -hmm. but don't understand what you do, right? So I had a guy come here and he painted my uh, kitchen and dining room area. And he said, can I, what do you do? You know, he saw the, the podcast equipment. He's like, what do you do? And so I had to articulate to him what I do. I hire people that are hard to find. And I've rehearsed that. I've practiced that. And so I've gotten it down to a small, simple thing that in this case, it was the painter. Right. Um, could understand. You don't have to be in my space to know what that means, to understand that, right? Um, and I think particularly high-tech people have a difficult time. Like, how do I just pare that down so it's digestible for everybody, for anybody? Like, I, I help software companies build elaborate, difficult, complex systems that make a really simple experience for somebody who's using an app. I lead teams who do that or whatever. And so oh, grandma gets that, you know, oh, okay. So you build these apps. Okay. Yeah, sure. Like you only have to make it make so much sense. Right. Right. So the gardener and the, uh, the gardener and the grandma principle is that you need to simplify what it is you do enough that somebody completely outside of your domain gets it. So it should be a one liner, not an elevator pitch, a one liner. Um, it's just one step on the staircase, not the whole elevator. Ride, <laughs> right. <laughs> a one liner. You, so you, what it does is it makes you clarify your your pitch and these are people who like you 
people fail to network with affinity and they, they network instead with relevance. But the people who are relevant are also competing with you. They don't care about you as much as they pretend to in the office. Sure. Um, but your grandma loves you, right? <laughs> <laughs> and she will introduce you to that one friend who comes into the salon who runs a tech company or whatever. And you might be close to being relevant, but that's a that's a great connection, right? Absolutely. So affinity is more valuable in your networking than relevance. And people miss that opportunity because those folks are commercials. It might be a commercial playing at the right the wrong time of day to the wrong demographic, but it's going to catch some ears, right? So anyway, Gardner and the grandma, that's how you network. Everybody, you can't miss those folks. People who like you and don't understand you, you need to work them into your circle too. That's great. Yeah. Thanks for letting me run that. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. What's going to get in your way over the next, you know, year or whatever? When you're trying to build who you are and build this product that you're working on, like what's going to get in your way? Your personal goals, your professional goals. You know, there's tons of things that could get in my way, but the yeah. only thing that can get in the way really is myself hmm. at the end of the day. Like it's me and it's, you know, do I make the right decisions? Do I empower the right people? Am I mm -hmm. leading wholeheartedly or am I, am I trying to amplify the wrong person? Am I amplifying mm -hmm. myself? So I, I think some of, those, some of those things are definitely things that can get in the way over time. And It's tough sometimes to know if you're depending on and investing in the right people. It is. That's stressful because people are such a finicky product. They never stay still. <laughs> yes. <laughs> how, do you, how do you figure that out? How do you know? How, do you, how long does it take you to figure it out? And how do you know if you're investing in and depending on the right people? It's always important to invest in a person and not have any expectations there. I can invest in one of my employees and they could leave tomorrow, but I still invested in that person. And I yeah. think it's investing in the person versus the employee to do a thing for you. Mm. And I think that's important. And yeah, that's refreshing. Yeah. So you're not using them like a tool. Right. It's, you know, if they do a great thing at another company, great. If they, you know, say something to a family member to help them out because of a comment that I made or, you know, them feeling better about themselves. Great. How embarrassing that I just had an aha moment what a, <laughs> <laughs> about not just standing on people and using them, or whatever. Mm -hmm. but that is so much the, that's the context in which I asked that question is so much of, uh, you know, you depend on so many other people when, to be successful when you're leading something, especially when you're senior leader responsible for big things. And I mean, granted, like I want a great team. I want a team that can deliver our products and all of the things for customers. And but I, I think more importantly than that, I want to ensure that those people are happy. Mm -hmm. And you know, happiness is is a balance, and yeah. making sure that they've got that balance because it's really hard in tech to keep that balance. Yeah, that's a really good point because when my love life, my children, my home, um, money, health, when all those things tend to be good at the same time. And then all of them suffer a bit when, when something, when one of your critical things, you know, your handful <laughs> of like key things is messed up. They all suffer a bit. Right. Um, so that's interesting. You said you, you invest in people and you, you work on making them happy. And, but I mean, can you really take responsibility for somebody's life? It's taking responsibility for their life, but just putting some guardrails in for them mm -hmm. on the track. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basically ensuring that they're, they're spending time outside of work mm -hmm. and they're able to disconnect and being able to help them with that disconnect yeah. and ensuring like, hey, it's, it's great you want to do this, but if we need more people, more time, those are things I can, I can help with. Yeah. I can't give you back time with your family. It's not something I can help with, you know, if you're not working with me and communicating these things. Yeah, what a refreshing attitude toward leadership. Just so everybody listening knows, I'm not a complete psychopath. <laughs> <laughs> I did just have a teammate the other day. I can tell on a, one of my, somebody on my team was like, I can tell he was not fully 100% engaged. And I said, you doing okay? You didn't seem like 100% yourself. Oh, just going through something. Okay, cool. Let me know if I can help. Right. And I think just like 
we'll revisit those things. You got to deal with something that's cool. And just making it okay to be a human, yeah. to have other things on your mind, be stressed at times by things that are not work. Just making it okay, I think sometimes makes you come back with a different kind of zeal, you know? And that was it. That was the end of that conversation. And then the next day it was like a different kind of energy or however long, a couple of days later, a different kind of energy. I was like, doing okay. Yeah. Better. Thanks. You know, and that's all you need, you know, just like make a little space for somebody to be a whole human being and have a whole life. You not know, have to show up every single day, chipper all the time. hundred percent. Like nobody's a hundred percent all the time. Do you think leaders put a lot of value into that? Into what? Into the, you know, being a human and, most don't showing up and because that's something that I put value into with my teams. I tend yeah, to I guess overshare I, a little bit just mm. to have comfort in a room. If a meeting, I hop onto a all of my meetings are virtual. Okay, and for the first five minutes, everyone's kind of signing in and it's quiet, and I'll just start saying words mm -hmm. and start asking questions. Mm -hmm. And hey, I see you're you're in Seattle. It's sunny today. How mm -hmm. weird! Like. How many mm. days is it sunny? Like, that's amazing. <laughs> and just starting to have conversations with people or sharing stories, you know. Hey, today I went to a farm and purchased some really cool, like, Amish butter and eggs. And mm -hmm. here's a picture of the goat from the farm. Like, how fun is that? <laughs> so just adding, adding experiences and showing people, like, I'm human too. Yeah. Is that, even, is that harder for you being 100% virtual? Is your whole team virtual? Yeah, my entire team's, um, well, I'm pretty much the only person remote um, okay. on the team. So it's definitely harder um, in some aspects, but in others, you know, it's easier. I, I wear yoga pants every single right, day. <laughs> right. The uniform is different for sure. Yoga pants and hoodies. Um, but, <laughs> but no, it's definitely, you know, connection. Like you have to, you have to try a little bit more um, mm -hmm. to be connected to people and ensure that there's connection points yeah. throughout the day. And when you think about the things that are going to get in your way, the Alicia and the Leah, the Alicia and the Alicia, all those mm -hmm. things that are going to get in your way, right? Yep. Um, for you to accomplish your professional goals, your personal goals, how are you, how are you preparing to, what are you doing now to prepare to kind of overcome or get past those obstacles you see yourself putting in your way? It's a bit of self-awareness and just being aware and not replaying every day, but just kind of processing like, am I still on that track? Am I still doing things that are outside of my comfort zone? Hmm. Did I sign up for another speaking engagement five minutes before I left to go to another one? Yes. <laughs> do, you know, am I nervous about it? Like, am I going to do well? Not sure. We'll hmm. see. Um, so I think it's, it's not a year of the yes. Like, I'm not going to go skydiving if you ask me to after this. Um, right. <laughs> I won't. I've it's, done it's, dangerous stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think just, you know, being outside of that comfort zone and just tracking and like, am I doing something that challenges me or am I just doing the same thing over and over mm -hmm. again? Because I want to keep growing in different ways. And it's not, it doesn't have to be a climbing the ladder kind of growth. It's personal growth as well. That's a really good I don't know if you'd call it a metric or whatever, but a barometer of sorts to assess whether or not you're pushing yourself. Are you doing anything that could embarrass you? Like, are you working on anything now that can embarrass you? My wife, um, my wife has dragged me into the gym to work out with her, and that definitely poses the threat of being embarrassed, right? For sure, yeah. <laughs> so, she's a little more fit than I am. So, uh, just a little. <laughs> but um, hosting a podcast, I mean, this is... I just, it's not brand new anymore, but I'm a sophomore, not a senior at this, you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, but I'm doing things on purpose. I'm doing things that, where there's a risk of failure, right? They're, that make me a little bit nervous, that things that could embarrass me, right? Um, but I, I think when I look at my life, to share your point, to agree with your point, if you're not doing anything that's like risks embarrassment, you're probably not. You're not doing anything new, right? right. You're not, you're not uh, pushing yourself at all. Anyway, thanks for that. That was a good validation right there. I think I needed that. You know you're going somewhere if you're not sure. You know you're going somewhere new if you're not sure where you are. Exactly. Yeah. Well, great conversation. Thank you very much for being here and recording this with me. Thanks.